Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation, a conversation with the authors of Visual Litigation, Visual Communication Strategies, and Today's Technology. My name is Erin Page, and I'm the Senior Law Librarian on staff with Fast Case Legal Research. Before I introduce my co-host, I just want to go over a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. The first announcement is that you may have noticed that you're currently in listen-only mode. Uh, this is to cut down on the amount of background noise so everyone can hear us. But you are welcome to ask questions at any point during today's presentation. To ask questions on your screen, you should still have the GoToWebinar pop-up. And one of the buttons on there is for the questions box. We welcome and encourage questions, so please feel free to ask them at any point during today's presentation and we'll try to work them into the flow. Second announcement. This is just a reminder that today's session is not for CLE credit. Fast Case does offer webinars that are for CLE credit. Those are available on Thursday afternoons at 1 p.m. You can sign up for them by going to fastcase.com forward slash webinars. All right, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Morgan Wright, who is the chief editor of the Full Court Press Imprimant. Uh, Morgan? Thanks, Aaron. We're excited to have um, so many people that have uh, signed up for this program. Really looking forward to discussing um, this book, Visual Litigation, which came out last year, kind of at the, the middle of the height of the pandemic. So we'd, it's really a great opportunity to give this, this book its due and explain a little bit more about it and how you can use it in your practice. Excellent. And we'd also like to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, our first speaker, oh, before we forget, there is a fair use reduction of this particular presentation. Um, see our slides, which we'll be sending out later today uh, for more information. Our first speaker is Mr. Muscat. Uh, he joined the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office in 1993 and is a prolific and excellent prosecutor in his current workplace. Um, he has led a number of ex excellent projects and is currently the Deputy Chief of special, the Special Prosecutions Division, as well as a prolific presenter and uh, speaker regarding use of technology in courtrooms, and of course, one of the authors of today's volume. Also with us is Ronald Clark. Uh, Ronald Clark is a well-known uh, lecturer and author, is currently a distinguished professor in residence at the Seattle University Law School and teaches both from the visual litigation book as well as directly for other classes and has been a prolific presenter and trainer with the Department of Justice, Department of State and other entities as well. Uh, gentlemen, I'd like to turn today's presentation over to you. Well, thank you very much, Morgan and, and Aaron, both of you. Uh, Pat and I are going to have a conversation this afternoon uh, focusing on the three W's, essentially why, you know, why are visuals so important uh, to persuasion? We're going to focus also on when. Uh, when can you use visuals? When should you use visuals? And when you shouldn't use visuals? When can you use visuals? You can use it anytime you're trying to persuade. And particularly here, we're focusing on, on uh, trial work, so in, in pretrial or in trial. And then we're also going to look at the what. You know, what is available? Uh, is it, uh, what's the technology that we have, both the software and the hardware? And we're also going to look at uh, different examples as we go along of the different types of visuals that can be used. Uh, all right, why use visuals? Why are they so important? I uh, was attending a CLE, by the way, that where folks did get credit, and uh, John Tierney was the speaker, and I want to share with you uh, what he said about visuals. He had a, uh, he asked the audience to think of a polar bear, and then he walked around through the audience asking different people, uh, all right, where is your polar bear looking? To the right or to the left or straight forward? And one person said to the right, another person said to the left, another person said looking right at me. And he asked, where is your polar bear? One said, on an iceberg, floating in the water. Another said, on the tundra. And then he, John asked another person, what is your polar bear doing? So one said, he's growling at me. So up on his hind feet, and growling at me. 
Another one said that uh, he's running along the tundra. The point of it was that no two people in the audience saw the same polar bear. They all had different polar bears that they came up in their mind's eye. And then John showed them a polar bear. Isn't this sweet? And now the point here is that one, if you want to have jurors or an arbitrator or mediator, understand what you're describing, use a visual. And the second point is that if you want people to come to a consensus, to really understand it, visuals will get them to that consensus. So, yeah. I, can't, um, I agree completely. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm going to give you an example from a homicide trial. This is an email from a juror after the trial, and the juror pretty much said everything that our book says and that Ron just said. Talked about the use of technology, um, the presentation. Now, if this were an exhibit that we were going to show in a trial, our book will walk you through how to set this up, but we admit this through old fashioned methods. Piece of paper gets admitted, then we publish it. But then in our argument, we may want to call it out because it's a lot of data to read. So we're going to use PowerPoint to make a very simple call out to highlight and direct the jury's attention and focus to what this particular piece of evidence is telling us or what we want to convey. There is an excellent study um, on jurors' reaction to lawyers. Litigation. It was done over the course of five or six years, um, and it was published by the Cornell Bar, Bar Review, uh, Law Review, excuse me. And it, it, I think they interviewed over 500 jurors out of the state of Illinois on federal matters, but they, there's a ton of data and feedback. There's quotes about everything that they liked and didn't like that the lawyers did. And there's a healthy section on technology and the attorney's use of technology. And I'll joke and say that for the comments or the critiques of the lawyers that didn't use technology well, um, they could have got our book and then they would have um, avoided the critiques. But regardless, we address all this stuff. And um, obviously it's a very big deal when you're prosecuting or trying cases in the 21st century. Um, there's some data out there on this topic. I'll touch on it a bit and then Ron will, but um, our jurors learn visually, and this is supported by the U.S. Department of Labor Research. Um, this, is how, this is how they entertain themselves, and this is how they learn through devices. My daughter, in fact, has spent most of the year in an online because of, uh, of the pandemic in her school. So she's used to receiving her um, knowledge a particular way. So we have to adapt to that as trial work. Ron? Uh, there's been one study showed that if a person only receives oral information, if I was just listening to someone, after a period of time, they'll only retain about 10% of it. If they receive it visually, they'll retain about 35%. But if you combine both the oral and the visual, they'll retain up to 65%. So put it this way, if you just heard me talk about it without this, without this visual, uh, you'd only retain about 10% of what I just said, all right? If you, um, if you wonder about what, how people are using technology, we run a visual trial school in Michigan, and we do a little poll of when people uh, use technology, and a lot of them, the, the overwhelming uh, tendency for criminal prosecutors is in closing argument, but also an opening statement, and direct and cross, and others. And our book talks about the different linear and nonlinear software tools we'll, we'll talk about during our presentation today. So we've talked about a few why to use visuals. Let's continue on a little bit. So it's perception and retention. We just covered that. Second, we have, it's how, how jurors learn. It's how they, how they learn about the case. Third, it's what they expect. It's what jurors now expect. It's just as much a part of a courtroom as it is part of a classroom to have 
have visuals and we've got the technology, the technology to create uh, visuals. So what we can do is we can use, uh, say, PowerPoint to create a visual, then print it out and then ex enlarge it so you can put it on a board. Or we think about the technology. Uh, when I began, we would take large notebooks with the case file with us to court. Uh, this was customary. But now you can put your case file, all of your exhibits, everything, visual as well as, as documents, uh, stored on a computer or on a, an iPad and take that to court with you and, and bring it up and project it on a screen so the jurors can see it. So uh, we've now got the technology. Another reason to use it is because it works, it's successful. And another reason is repetition and highlighting. Uh, children have uh, show and tell where they bring something to school and they, they tell about it. Uh, lawyers, good trial lawyers, know that you have tell and show. You have a witness describe what happened. You introduce an exhibit, a visual, and then you show it and have the witness talk about what's in the visual. So you're essentially repeating what's the information and bringing it alive both orally and visually. And you can also create evidence. By that, I mean, if you uh, look at say evidence rule uh, 1006, you can create a summary chart and then use that uh, in, in trial. In fact, it, the summary chart can be admitted in trial. There's one other I wanna to touch on. And that is, I had a case uh, in which there was a lion stolen from the Woodland Park Zoo uh, in Seattle. And uh, yes, I could have just had the director of the zoo uh, come in and talk about it. But instead, I had him bring along a cub that was about the same uh, size as the lion cub that was stolen from the zoo. And while the director was testifying, the lion was sitting on his lap, licking his face, and the jurors just uh, <laughs> more than engaged. Uh, so I must say, uh, it can bring a case alive and also uh, for the lawyer that's that's using visuals, it can also be fun. So I thought I'd really done it with the lion in the courtroom until I saw this in Texas. Uh, it's a little much to have the American flag wrapped around the donkey's neck, I think. But, but we, I've seen I've seen a car taken apart and taken into a courtroom and reassembled overnight. So when the jurors come in in the morning, they have the the car is right there uh, that that was part of the of the evidence in the case. So those are some concrete reasons. All right, when should we use it? Obviously, we should use visuals when we want to tell a story. So there's a solid reason to do so. One great visual that, that's really uh, usable in almost every opening statement is a timeline. And here from the Derek Chauvin uh, murder trial involving uh, the victim, uh, George Floyd, is the, at the top, you have, you have Chauvin kneeling on the neck of George Floyd for that nine minutes and 29 seconds. And across the bottom, you have what he was saying and what was happening to him as that nine minutes and 29 seconds passed. So the lawyer, uh, and who was the, the prosecutor in this case, could tell the story using this visual so that it would give the jurors an understanding of the chronology and the amount of time that it took. So one of the ways that we can uh, use a timeline too, we can also be a little less traditional about it. This is a very simple timeline that um, along with the book, um, we also provide some resources uh, and some of them are sample PowerPoints. But one of the ways that I like to argue this example is we have our bowl viewing party on January 1st. We start around 11, 15 p.m. or a.m., excuse me. We're all there to watch the Rose Bowl and other football. Around 12.15, the witnesses all testified that uh, Bo went missing. They, they, no one really saw where Bo went. They can't remember if they saw where he went. But they all testified that he was gone for a good period of time. 
And then the witnesses all testified they saw him emerge from the back room where the food had been served, um, ranch dip, chili, typical football food, always looking like this, with ranch dip all over the place. Ladies and gentlemen, that's circumstantial evidence to what Bo did while he was in that room, even though nobody saw him while he was in there. And uh, yes, ranch dip was on the ceiling, in case you're curious. I had to clean it off the ceiling. That's good old Bo. So when uh, we go into a little more depth, a lot more depth in the book about creating visuals and the basics though, are that any visual that, that you want to use at trial should be number one, clear, should be two, concise, creative, and convincing. So we're going to take a look in a moment here at a, a linear slideshow. Uh, in other words, just it's PowerPoint's most common uh, linear slideshow where you have one slide, then another slide, then another slide, then another slide. And Pat's going to go into nonlinear uh, later. But as you watch uh, this uh, video clip, this is uh, Jerry Blackwell, and he is doing a rebuttal argument in the Chauvin case. Uh, the defense in that case was that uh, essentially it was a coincidence that uh, George Floyd had health and other conditions, uh, and that it was mere uh, coincidence that uh, Chauvin uh, for nine minutes and 29 seconds. So uh, Blackwell could have in, uh, rebutted that uh, defense argument orally, but instead he used a visual and see whether or not it's clear, concise, creative, and convincing. Let's watch him. You'll see what I mean. Take, for example, the notion that Mr. Floyd died of cardiopulmonary arrest, dying from low oxygen, was just coincidental. He just happened to die at the same time, in the same place, of factors completely unrelated to what Mr. Chauvin was doing with his subdual restraint and neck compression. That's the story, ladies and gentlemen. It defies common sense. I'll show you what I mean. And we looked at over his lifetime. You'll see here, if we uh, look over 10 years, 20, 30, 40 years, up to uh, May 25th of 2020, that means that Mr. Floyd would have lived up to that day, 17,026 days. Now, only one of these dots corresponds to May 25th. Only one of them. All the rest of these days, all the rest of these dots, represent days that Mr. Floyd was living. He was breathing. He had a being. He was living. He was breathing and had a being with every single disorder that Mr. Nelson has chronicled. Each and every day. You know, with his struggles with opioid addiction, uh, with his high blood pressure, et cetera, every single day, except the one day. May 25th, that tiny little speck on the dime, and not even that whole day. Because as we know, there was a 10 minute segment, nine minutes and 29 seconds, that he didn't survive. So in, a, in one day's time, there are 144 of those, 10 minute seconds. And only one of them was the reason that Mr. Floyd uh, failed to survive. And what happened in that space? Well, you know what happened. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where there was deadly force applied by Mr. Chauvin. We know there's deadly force because we heard from Officer Zimmerman on the stand, who told us it was deadly force. He said it's deadly force because it's force capable of killing the person, which makes it deadly force. Now, deadly force, uh, ladies and gentlemen, once you see what Mr. Floyd was subjected to with this deadly force in the prone position, uh, there are certain consequences for the risk So as you can see, a very nice linear slideshow. The one other thing that I want to touch on when should visuals be used, they're, they're wonderful to use with expert witnesses or where the evidence is complicated. As you can see at the bottom here, they're always 
great when you want to simplify the complicated. I really the greatest expert out there on on visuals. And Tufty in his in his uh, book uh, on visuals put it this way. He said, not the complication of the simple, rather the task of the designer is to give visual access to the subtle and the difficult, that is the relevation of the complex. So uh, we go through in, in uh, through the book, discussing how visuals can be used with expert witnesses to make it understandable by a jury. Now, when shouldn't we use visuals? Well, there's certain uh, boundaries, both legal and ethical, that cannot be crossed. Uh, Pat and I and, and Tom have uh, a chapter that we've put together on all of those legal and ethical boundaries that should not ever be crossed because it can result in not only a reversal of the case, a mistrial, or in fact, uh, a rebuke of the person who offers it. I want to give you one example, and this is from uh, a Washington case. The prosecutor decided that they would take uh, a booking photograph of the defendant, Glassman, and then print guilty, guilty, guilty across his face uh, and use that during closing argument. The state Supreme Court in Washington, by the way, that's not Glassman, that's uh, Ted Bundy. Uh, the Washington State Supreme Court condemned the use of it in, in Glassman. And specifically, the court said, during closing argument, the prosecuting attorney made an electronic presentation to the jury that graphically displayed the personal opinion of Glassman was guilty, guilty, guilty of the crimes charged by the state. The prosecutor's misconduct was flagrant, ill-intentioned, and cannot conclude with any confidence that it did not have an effect on the outcome of the trial. We reverse the defendant's convictions and remand for a new trial. It's important that we all be aware of that. And then Pat's going to go over some of the other opinions that allow uh, visuals. Yes, Glassman and a few other cases, McKay um, from the state of Washington are very important cases to read if you intend to use visuals in the courtroom, uh, particularly in criminal law. However, the vast majority of cases around the United States are consistent with People v. Anderson and the concept, as long as your argument is consistent with the evidence, then your slides will be fine. Uh, in Kentucky, uh, they talk about comparing PowerPoint to a blackboard, which was, you know, when I started out trying cases 25 years ago, I was using blow up charts and chalkboards. You know, um, my favorite is Riviera from New Jersey, where again, the focus is really not the tool that you're presenting it with, it's the content. And is the content evidence based, based on the evidence or reasonable inferences? So what, now we're gonna to turn to both the hardware and the software that can be used. Here is a uh, federal courtroom in, in uh, Seattle. And as you look around the courtroom, there, there are uh, screens both uh, on council table. Uh, there's a, one other screen and you'll notice that each one of the jurors has an individual uh, screen that they can look uh, at the visuals when they're introduced. It's a very modern courtroom, and the federal court, in fact, requires uh, counsel to uh, be trained in the use of all of the technology that's there. You can go to a federal court uh, without having to bring in any, uh, any equipment at all. On the other hand, uh, the King County Courthouse uh, here is, uh, and the last one there, Pat, if you have it, the last slide of the courthouse. That courthouse, as you look around, it it has not been uh, refurbished since 1926, and it's while it's wonderful, uh, old old wood and old bookcases, uh, it is antiquated to say the least, and there is no equipment 
if you want to try a case in that courtroom and use technology, you have to bring it along with you, and which is what we see here with the screen installed in a, in a place where it can be viewed by the jury. So uh, it depends upon your courtroom. Now we're going to shift over to software. I I showed you um, a little linear software, and as Pat has indicated, uh, linear software is ideal for opening statement and closing argument, where you can just use it. It's very much like a lecture in a in a, a CLE or in a in a classroom, uh, one slide after another, and it works right along with a presentation also ideal with an expert witness who if you can get the expert witness on the, on her feet in front of the jury with a powerpoint she's in a teaching mode and can use uh use linear software that's now going to talk to us about verse with us about uh, non-linear software oh yeah, and man. how to yeah sorry ron excuse me uh so one thing I want to point out, and, and, and we address in the book as well, is that, you know, Ron and I are trial lawyers first. You know, we're advocates first. We learned how to try cases first before we learned how to use technology. Uh, so I, when I teach law students, I give them an example and say, if you have a 10 minute closing argument, you may only want slides up there for 20% of the time. You do, you know, webinar, we're going to have content and material the whole time because it's a webinar. But in the courtroom, you're gonna you have to master the skills of blanking the screen using the white button or the B button on the keyboard or the particular mouse you're using. We talk about those very um, in the weeds nuances in the book and some of the equipment like this Logitech Spotlight that I'm using. You see me use a laser pointer, zoom, and spotlight. But anyhow, PowerPoint, I as Ron mentioned, I use it in my opening and the beginning of my closings. In Michigan, we have a closing and a rebuttal. It's very linear, knocks off the points I want to make. But when I do direct and cross, I like to use non-linear um, presentation tools. There are a few products that are designed specifically for non-linear presentation, which in other words, you put all your slides up in any order you want, or all you're really doing is loading your evidence into a, into a, a program and you call them up in any order. Um, I could load and prepare a thousand exhibits in five minutes with sanctioned litigation software. We talk about that in the book, um, and I'll show you that in a second. But we also talk about how you can use PowerPoint and make PowerPoint nonlinear in a very simple way. For example, um, you can insert all your photographs into a photo album, and you can see good old Remy here jumping off the lake up in northern Michigan, um, and that's slide 51. If I want to go back to slide one, I can just hit slide one quickly, and I can use this mouse to highlight what I want to, and then I can blank the screen. And then I want to go back to slide 51, I just type in 51. So now what I've done with a very simple technique is made PowerPoint nonlinear. Um, and we also provide you an example of this exhibits template. And what this is, is something I made that is pre-marked pre -marked template. So if you click on exhibit three, it's going to take you to exhibit three. And then you click again, it's going to take you to the main screen. This is what it looks like, um, and here's a picture of a Wayne County courtroom, all equipment hauled in. Um, we do have flat screens now installed, so that's great. And if you're a Detroit Tigers fan, there's Coleman at the Park. Um, so there's your exhibits template. Let me just mention wow. that that Pat put this together, uh, the template that you you saw there. Uh, he put it together, and along with the book, we have uh, a companion uh, website. So if you wish, you can go in and, and download his, his template and use it. So it's a, a wonderful gift that he's put together for you. Thanks, yeah. And then again, the Spotlight presentation tool, that kind of stuff is highlighted in our materials. And what I'm doing right now is I'm using the laser pointer feature. I'm using the Spotlight feature, thus the name. I'm using the Zoom feature. And I can advance the slides, forward the slides, change the audio. And um, let me show you. I can change the audio just by doing this. With, uh, for the record, I'm raising and lowering the spotlight. Never forget to make your record, even when you're using technology. Um, and then 
here's some other tools where you can be non-linear. Um, Crime Lines is a new product I have never used in court, but uh, check it out. It's it's a timeline type software. And then the one that I've used the most, and I've tried hundreds of, of cases, jury trials, and mostly homicides, is the sanction litigation software. But there's also a very good uh, app on the iPad called the Tri Trial Pad. So let me show you short videos that have no sound of demonstrating both those products. Here's Sanction, and what I'm this is a video. You're not looking at the software, it's a, a video of the software, but I've loaded in an aerial, and you can zoom on the fly like this. You don't have to pre-make those slides. You just take an exhibit and zoom when you want. And I've, now I'm bringing up two different exhibits because what I'm showing to the jury is these buoys mark guns that were recovered by the police, and one of the guns had a serial number on it, even though it's the bottom of a lake and you could match it to evidence in the case. So that's sanctioned, it's pretty powerful. It has, uh, this is a, a fake forensic image example that um, expert witnesses use, and this is of the Death Star, but this is a sample of what um, an expert might pull from a phone or a computer. And what I like to do with these forensic image reports is I admit them as summaries, and then I actually bring up the report twice. And I put one side on the left, um, whatever I'm highlighting, whatever page, and the other point I'm highlighting from the same voluminous report on the right, and I walk it through with my witness. And I the flexibility to do that on direct, all I have to do is memorize the codes. And once you try cases a lot, you um, will find that pretty easy to do. Uh, here's the trial pad app on the iPad. It looks very similar. In this example, I'm using an Apple Pencil to operate the device. It connects to a monitor just like Sanction, which runs off a laptop, and it creates that nonlinear tool. So here you see on the left, I can just pick the evidence. I want to pick this picture of a, a FBI agent um, testifying that was published. And there you can see me using a gyration mouse, which is another tool we talk about, it allows you to do some neat things. Um, it's an air mouse, but you can highlight, you can call out. And the jury is just seeing, you know, the picture that you're showing them and the, and the call outs and the highlights. Um, so, again, another example, two different nonlinear tools that we talk about in detail in the book. And Ron's going to tell you a little bit about another neat tool called SmartDraw. Let me just jump in on TrialPad, too, just to oh, okay. emphasize the, the TrialPad uh, is a wonderful tool um, for any uh, you know, fairly simple case. It's wonderful. You just, all you need is your iPad. You can walk around the courtroom and, and just use that. You can also not only uh, use it non-linearly, you can have your, your uh, PowerPoint on it. So it's a, it's a fabulous tool and it's very inexpensive uh, compared to, to other uh, software programs that are out there. Um, I, I don't know. I think it was, hundred and some um, dollars compared to uh, a lot more for others. So thanks, Pat. Yep, and if you want to get adventurous, uh, what I don't maybe recommend for a jury trial, but maybe for a hearing, you can bring in an Apple TV, broadcast your own signal in the courtroom, and walk around with your iPad, um, not plugged into anything. It's kind of neat. Uh, now we're going to move on to Smart Draw. Smart Draw is a wonderful tool. Uh, you know, you can spend thousands upon thousands of dollars uh, putting together uh, graphics for for trial. Uh, Smart Draw allows you to to uh, once you get the program to create visuals yourself. This is a crime scene uh, diagram where you can just pull uh, the different images into a floor plan. And so it's it's a wonderful piece uh, that you can use to put together um, as long as you've got a witness who can say that, yes, that's what it looks like, uh, and that's what I saw. So it's terrific. Now, um, all of the things that we've been going over so far, uh, both Pat and I teach uh, in law schools. And so to give students uh, the experience of working cases, the the book comes with both a criminal case and a civil case. 
when I teach at the uh, uh, visual trial and technology, uh, the students are, are tasked to put together with Smart Draw uh, the scene, either in the civil case or in the criminal case. And we do the same sort of thing. Uh, we go from opening statement, uh, well, opening statement through closing argument with them putting together directs, cross, uh, and closing. And, and so it's it's a, a wonderful experience. It can also be used for CLE programs, but uh, the students just love love the the course uh, because it gets them uh, to understand visuals, and it also gives them uh, the experience with the technology. Yep, and uh, we have a sample uh, syllabus in there too. Um, I think it's a excellent. Uh, excellent material that comes along with it. So um, let's bring it. Here's our, our little end slide here. Um, Got to have a little law and order for a couple prosecutors that are presenting. And there we go. There's our contact information. I'll turn it over to you, Ron. Before Ron continues, okay. we do have a couple questions. Yes, we do have a couple Certainly. questions from the audience if you guys are ready. Certainly. So one of the questions from the audience was regarding visuals and um, not necessarily the positive end, but the negative end of visuals. Can they be more distracting for from the testimony than they're worth? And how do you prevent them from being more distracting than they're worth? So the example he was referencing was the one with the lion cub. This is a, that's a wonderful question. And, and in the book, and when I talk to my students about it, I try and emphasize over and over again that visuals are there to enhance the presentation and not to uh, to upstage it. So that it's it, it's important to understand how to use your visuals at on all different uh, uh, during all the different phases in trial. Uh, in terms of opening statement, you want to make sure that your slides are simple and that you're not causing death by PowerPoint, which some folks use too much text, too many visuals, and blanking the screen so that you're talking directly to a jury and then coming back to it. Uh, I'm just talking now about opening and closing. Uh, when you're doing direct and cross, you want to be very selective. And I, I mentioned uh, expert witnesses just turning it over to the expert and letting the expert uh, use the slides that will enhance what they're saying as opposed to too much. So it's always good to work with the expert of, uh, you know, when they're uh, working on whatever slideshow they want to have. Pat? Yeah, a couple points. Um, a great question, and that's what we spend a lot of time um, focusing with, particularly with younger law students who are tech savvy but don't have trial experience. Um, uh, the Cornell study, which you can find just by Googling Cornell, what jurors really think, has a lot of actual data from the jurors and their reaction to questions they don't like, thing, presentation styles they don't like with, with lawyers. But um, the nice thing about the litigation software, the nonlinear tools, or simply blanking the screen like hitting the W button or the B button, is that they have they all have blank screen modes. So when you're using, the, the way I equate it is to like, you know, every prosecutor has probably picked up a firearm in, in, a, in a trial at some point, prosecutor firearm case and had the actual firearm. And with the jury's, the court's permission, you can pick it up if necessary, show it to the jury or any other piece of evidence. But you don't pick it up and carry it around the whole trial because it's distracting. So you learn how to put it down. So everybody looks at the exhibit, when you're publishing something, the lawyer uses the exhibit to be persuasive, and then he puts it away, or she puts it away, and she goes on with her direct and her cross. So those come that those are trial advocacy techniques, and they adapt very nicely to the litigation software and the visual trial techniques. You know that that again going back to the question, you know how much is too much technology and. and and you know, do you want to use high tech, low tech, or in fact, no tech? Uh, you know, sometimes no tech is much better than any tech at all. Uh, there is nothing more dramatic than, and again, we're both prosecutors, than taking a single photograph of the victim 
and walking it down in front of the jury, stopping, holding it there, looking the juror in the eye, watching the reaction of the juror, and then moving to the next one. Uh, you could put it up on a screen fine, but it's that interaction, that personal interaction is so important. And again, uh, you know, you want never, never um, have a visual upstage uh, the presentation or the information you're trying to get across. Absolutely. Another question from the audience. Um, you mentioned a couple of studies during your presentation regarding how much is retained and regarding how much attention people are paying to the visuals and to audio materials. Is there a particular study or jury trial consultant review or anything of that nature that you recommend that people read for information on these statistics? Um, you know, that's right off the top. The Cornell study is that we have uh, readily available. Um, if, if you'd like more information, you know, you've got my email address there. Uh, just send me an email and I'll be glad to give you a list of, of other uh, studies. Uh, I might mention that, and Thomas O'Toole is, is our other, Tom O'Toole is our other co-author. Uh, he actually is the president and, and uh, CEO of Sound Jury. He likewise uh, has a great deal of information because he has, a, and believe it or not, a PhD in, in this. Uh, so we can draw on him for other uh, studies. So I'm more than glad to get them to you. Yeah, I um, I echo that. Um, I you know my I come from a my father is a mounted police officer was retired and my mom was a teacher and so when I was young and first getting into this use of technology and trial advocacy in general I researched academic topics studies about learning and teaching and uh, it's been years since I pulled up one of those recently but um, it is uh, I think any trial lawyer will tell you that. The need for competent use of visuals is is pressing even more now, um, as the attention span of people who become jurors lessens and lessens. With the um, just the total assault of of in technology in their lives. Fantastic, Morgan. I believe the next question is actually for you. Uh, can you comment a bit on the differences between the books print and uh, PDF formats? And will there be other e-formats available in the future? Sure. So for most of the books that we publish with Full Court Press, we offer them in three formats. Uh, print copy, obviously, this one is a soft cover, uh, matte, kind of larger size uh, paperback copy. Um, PDF, which is largely the same. It's just a digital version. Yeah, there, there he has it right there. Um, and then we also offer the book on Fastcase, which is our, our legal research system, as an annual um, subscription fee. And the real benefit when you access it on Fastcase is if there's anywhere where a case is linked or their URLs are mentioned, all that information is linked. And it's also very easy to search the book or um, just navigate throughout the text to the various chapters and things like that. And that's an annual fee. So if you have a fast case legal research subscription already, it's sort of an add on. You pay to access the book for a year. If a new edition of the book happens to come out, you will also automatically have access to that um, new edition that comes out. And if you're interested in purchasing the book, um, Aaron is posting the link to the store page where you can purchase it in the chat. And there will also be a follow-up email after this webinar with a link to go to the store page to purchase the book as well. Absolutely. And again, I'd like to highlight, as our wonderful speakers have, that purchase of the book comes with access to that additional supplemental materials webpage that includes several of the templates that the speakers have been referring to during the course of today's webinar. So, um, and it looks like we have a couple of positive comments in the questions box, people who have already purchased, and we thank you for doing that as well. Um, I think that I've hit all of the questions that have come up in the questions box, but I would like to take a moment and sincerely thank both of our presenters for an excellent demonstration on why visuals are so important in the a legal context, both in the classroom and in court. I mean, this has been a really great experience to see some of the examples of how this would work and how you would actually use this technology to improve your court presence and to make sure that the jurors and everyone are able to access and able to understand what's going on in the trial. 
Uh, do you, either of you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? I just want to thank, uh, well, Aaron uh, and Morgan, both of you. It's been a great experience to work with, with uh, Full Court Press and uh, also Pat, since he's here, I'll thank him as well. <laughs> so it's been a joy all the way around. I, I echo the sentiment. I will say that this is probably my first and only book um and but ron's got a whole stack of them uh he's a he's a he was a professional prosecutor for many years and he's a professional writer and he, and he does very well so it was very much my pleasure to work with ron and tom and, and everybody at fast case and uh it was really neat to after 25 years of doing this to see um something get published and uh, i enjoy using it in my law school class as well because um, I've been using other people's materials for a long time, and now I'm using my own, so that's pretty cool. Great. I want to thank you. Um, thank you both for your time so much. We sincerely appreciate it. And if you're um, in the audience and you're interested in maybe going back to some of the points that these gentlemen made in their presentation, we'll also be posting this on our YouTube channel, I believe. Is that right, Aaron? That's correct. So you'll be able to uh, pause and see some of the examples in more detail if you need to. So, uh, and speaking I of, just wanted to uh, toss in, can I toss in one more thing? Oh, I'm yes, always absolutely. tossing in one more thing. I, I, I just want to thank all the folks. It's really unusual, uh, you know, to, to do these where you don't, you can't see the folks that attended. And I want to thank you for your attention and, and thank you for being here. So, thanks. absolutely. <laughs> so, last thought from everyone, which is we will be doing for, uh, future webinars, uh, other authors, other. Uh, great speakers. So please keep an eye out in your email for announcements regarding our future sessions. We have a couple of really great authors coming up. So uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for their time and attendance today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out either to the authors directly or to FastCase by emailing us at support, that's S-U-P-P-O-R-T, at fastcase.com. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Pat. Take care, Ron. Have a good day. Take care, everybody at Fast Case. Thanks. You too.